Tan is well known as an investigative journalist now on the Daily Maverick and author most lately of the autobiography Hitler, Verwut Mandela and Me. And I got to talk to her about her amazing book and about the Gupta leaks and what else has been happening and will happen in South Africa. Yeah. So Maron, I've waited such a long time for you to be sitting here since I first read the book. It was last year. Yeah, I think it I read your book. feels like longer. Yeah. Right from the beginning, and I think especially even right at the beginning of the book, the thing that really struck me about your book was that it was so much a book about your father and your relationship with him. I felt that I was reading a book about a, a, a relationship with a difficult father that gradually changes mm. and doesn't change easily either. Mm. It requires a lot of you mm. for that relationship to actually change. Mm. The, the striking thing that you start with is that the fact that your dad, you know, coming from Germany was a member of the Hitler Youth and, mm. and you find yourself in this country understanding what's going on and yet your father seems to represent an earlier fascist regime or whatever. Mm. So did you struggle from that early on? How conscious were you early on about what's happening in this country? I was very conscious and I think uh, uh, I see it now. Uh, I, th I see all the differences that I, that, that I embody mm. as blessings because um, when you feel out of place in a community, and that was a, a white, uh, mixed English Afrikaans speaking immigrant community in Pretoria, and um, you could, you know, the Afrikaans kids were working class and quite uh, hostile towards us, but that was fun as a child. Mm. But I saw the responses to black South Africans around me, the, the yellow vans arriving, just arresting people en masse. I mean, as a child witnessing that, you realize something's very wrong here. Mm. Or you have um, people being chased off lawns when they're sitting resting. And so as a child, you begin to become awakened to something really quite ugly happening in the world. Um, and then you realize you're different because you don't really like boys that way. You like them very, very much in every other aspect. Mm. But in the one aspect that sort of, you know, is expected of you, you don't. So I think those were the slow awakenings. And my father was a very, I found him a very beautiful man in many ways. Um, um, but when I became aware of the politics and that he was German and was watching the world at war and the absolutely devastating... Um, uh, effects that, that Germans had on people's lives. I mean, 55 million people died in that war. Oh, wow. That's more than are alive in South Africa today. That's oh, just... That's, uh, it's inconceivable. It's really. inconceivable. Yeah. And so, apart from the Holocaust and the number of people persecuted and killed and was the kind of... I felt the spiritual aftermath of what, what did that do to people in Europe? What did that do to my father? How did this happen? And how come somebody in my house... He's not just in books. I mean, there's somebody walking around in my house who did this. I am from him and of him. Um, and I think that I found existentially very painful to deal with. And, I'm, you know, and, and it keeps evolving and it keeps um, taking new shapes as, as I've let go of him in one way, come to terms with him in the book another way. I've put him in his... In his it's like a hard drive. I've downloaded him. Okay, so he's, you know, he's nicely he's, contained. He's nicely contained <laughs> in that book and I've come to love him very deeply yeah. um, uh, in the aftermath of that. Understanding we are all caught in our, in our time and that we should be doing more but we don't always know how to do mm. more. And that I wanted to find out who is George scarred of all of those things we told we are. You know, the culture, the language, the history, the maleness... I wanted to find an essence of that spirit that was there, but it's very damaged mm. by much of what was around him. Um, and so I think I've come to see in the working through of all of that uh, an essence of George. And I saw his re interaction with other people, yeah. and that's what really mattered to me more than what he said. Exactly. You know, was my father was yeah. never rude to anybody. My father was, you know, as, despite himself, immediately yeah. fell in love with my children. And well, his reaction to your children was, was just like amazing. It was, it was really beautiful. Because I warned him, I said to me, you, I detect anything yeah. and I'm, they're out of your life. And he was unable to help himself. And I was looking for that, yeah. that spirit that was unable to help itself, that just fell in love with the children. You know, um, so, you know, and my mother also had a stroke a long, long time before that. So I lost her almost in that way. But she's always there as well. I mustn't forget her, that feminine energy. I mustn't yeah. forget her. No, well, I mean, I think her, she is in the background to me almost. I read the book thinking a lot, I wonder what your mother is, mm. what's happening with your mother, because 
you know, she herself said, you say in the book, that the last thing she wanted to do was have a stroke and be kept alive. Mm. And that's what happens to her. Mm. So I, I kept on wondering, kind of, did she know that was going to happen? Why did she Maybe. even say that? Maybe. But um, so, so George was watch, watching World at War. How did he respond to... Well, you know, see, how it was depicted. What I can remember, and of course all our memories are different as we, you know, what I can remember him saying is that be careful because this is sort of, some of it is, is American propaganda. Mm. You won't be seeing what happened to the people of Dresden mm. in this, in this mm. series. You won't be, you know, they didn't go to war in certain places because people made sausages there, you know, the people right. went for oil. So I think he tried to understand the kind of deeper political levels of what was happening, but that still, for me, mm. didn't justify anything. No, nothing justifies, but I was always aware that we never see anything about resistance, and there must have been. Yes. Well, I mean, listen, listen, I mean the atomic bomb is also something we, yeah. we, you know, we kind of think, well, that's okay because the Allies did it. Yeah. You know, they did it to the bad guys. You know, and so, I, so it was that. I think he was trying to say, look, it's not as simple as it seems. And I was saying, it's very simple. It's mm. about choices. Mm. You know, you either kill people because of what they are or you don't. And either you use a war to do that or you, yeah. you use the chaos of a war to persecute a neighbor uh, or a fellow human being. But that is the human condition. That's what I've come to realize, shockingly, that it's about the st a state of equilibrium that mm. needs to be found yeah. and that there are always people, uh, and it continues now, who sort of, I don't know, gather the forces of greed and evil and self-interest, and then there are always people who fight it and who pay. Yeah. But both sides pay. They're both sides, and it's, yeah, so as you said, it's clearly part of the human condition, yeah. and we've always been yeah. doing it. And that you must never stop, and that sort of, kind of oh, I thought I could relax, I thought <laughs> I could sit under a tree <laughs> and smoke a joint on an upturned coke, <laughs> great, and like, oh, yeah. yes, we've done it, but no. All the people I've met who, who are relatively intact and able to fight quite an oppressive system have mothers who've loved them mm. ridiculously. Yeah. You know, um, so my mother uh, did that for my brother and I. She just absolutely adored us, thought we were wonderful, which we did too for yeah. a very long period of time yeah. until we realized it. You know, <laughs> one of my first girlfriends says, Look, uh, you, you know, I just thought I was lovable. I didn't have to do anything like that. I didn't have to do anything like that. So my, so my mom, uh, you know, has given me what I call this panic room, this nest inside of myself mm. that I can retreat into when I feel it's too much and it's very safe and, mm. and, and wonderfully loving. And then I can, from there, always, I'm surprised myself, plot a comeback. Yeah. You know, so whatever goes wrong, and, and I, I kind of don't take things personally in the universe, like either losing a job no, or losing a contract. That is, that's a great mother. Because yeah. she did, I think she did accept you. you know, she did. Yeah, she, she did. Uh, well, there's something about it being having equal rights that then renders you unable to fight back. You know, I'm a rebel. <laughs> I want to rebel against you something. Be I don't want to be like something. everybody else, paying tax and being able to get married. You know, so yeah. suddenly I'm like everyone else. So I, I, I think I have oppositional personality disorder. Yeah. Quite willful, I think is what. You yes, mean, and I think my father and my family suffered because of my willfulness, and mm. I felt constantly marginalised. But I do think I was quite a force to be reckoned with, and although I did see myself as a bit of a victim then. So when you when you started working at the, uh, as a journalist in like nineteen eighty two or something, um, and so you had that strong and rebellious character, was that partly what motivated? I mean, was political journalist on the horizon from the beginning, or was it no. just the job? Uh, well, I don't think there wasn't. Uh, I don't think at that point there, I had any idea what the hierarchy was like, and, and it was a very much a man's world. Remember, mm -hmm. I had a very naive and childish reason for entering journalism and that was really simply saying I wanted to tell the truth. Well. I could see that what was going on around me just wasn't what yeah. was in you know, just wasn't okay. And then I thought this would be quite a nice way yeah. uh, to find a platform with my messianic complex that I would fix this. Well it might be naive but it's pure. It's yeah. a motivation. Well Bob Marley was my was my guide. You know, Bob <laughs> yeah. Marley was my, my 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 sort of held my hand through the ether there. Um, so that was kind of what I wanted to do. It was like this doesn't have to be this way. What can I do? How can I play a role? Uh, quite naively thinking, well let's find a truth telling mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of was what it was. And it grew, obviously. You know. Well, as you get sort of plunged into the truth because you have almost no. Mm. Uh, then you start to see what it is you need to see. And that job took me from sort of normal general reporting in courts where everybody washes up, 
you know, he was on the wrong side of the law. And at that point, you didn't have to do much to be on the wrong side of the law. You just had to be black. Yeah. You know, Basically. and then you were on the wrong side of the law. So you begin to see, you know, you choose this thing. And then when I got, when that got, when it became sort of insane, because at the one uh, story I wanted to do was I thought one of my parents had been murdered and kind of accepted it as just, oh, well, okay. Wow. It's now happened to me. Was then when the newsroom decided, no, you're not okay. And that's when I was beautifully transitioned into the, the other space that has held me and nourished me and opened up what that other world was and that's the arts right it was theater poetry yeah. music it was it came into my life just as i needed it and it was as confrontational and i realized that this space had a kind of a, a, a different ethos to it there was there was a, a a light to the to the brutality and the darkness there was a uh, a shaping of the narrative that that could be taken back mm. and could be regurgitated and presented back. The truth telling had more layering than just there is the dead body, right. there is the blood, there is right. the this, there is the that, there is the the, the brutality, and so if, so you know it it came to shape and become this thing, molded something. I, I realized very soon in that world at that time um, that your career path was limited as a woman. Uh, you know, less limited than the generation before yeah. me, but still limited. So, so then, how did that get to women's magazines? Was one of the th things that maybe I can go further in a world like that. Well, what's interesting, I think, is that Jane Rafaeli realised as as the country changed. Now, Jane is just very sort of plugged into the frequencies of what is happening around her, very and much how, so. yeah, absolutely, and how she can introduce that to her audience. She knows who her audience is, and she knows what they need to learn mm. or how they need to be shifted into the new space of the world. So Jane's capacity for that must never be underestimated and in the early late uh, late 80s early 90s Jane was understood that the Berlin Wall had come down that South Africa's politics was about to change and she needed to get into her magazines journalists who'd been in the so-called real world Pippa Green who was a mm -hmm. labor journalist myself I'm trying to think of who else was there um, quite a few journalists who'd, who'd, who'd kind of been on the front lines of the ugly and she said to us, look, come and, work, come and work for us. I think that, you know, Jane interviewed me and I said, look, I, I was wearing, I always used to wear black. I've gone back to wearing it. It was so easy. <laughs> My mother used to say, you're all well black when I die. But she didn't realize I really <laughs> love black. Um, but I was wearing a pair of boots with a hole underneath because I didn't care. And I said, I roll my own tampons, Jane, cut my own hair. <laughs> and she laughed. And she said, no, I, what I'd like our journalists to try and interview the Baleka Khotsisile Bedes who'd come back from exile, mm. who Frenich and Wala, what was happening. So this, there was that, that is what drew us into women's magazines. Wow. And was it, it was an interesting experience, you know, on many, mm. on many other fronts. It took me into a world that I had absolutely no interest in, you know, um, fashion but, and makeup. She actually once said to me, I'd sooner send out a magazine without a cover than without a horoscope. Absolutely. And it was hugely popular. Yeah. You know, there's this thing with that, that those of us who claim to be non-believers sort of, you know, uh, it's all about, you know, molecules and mm. kind of, I mean, I love watching this channel of yours because I've, I've said, as I said to you earlier, because I've, I've been immersed in, I think, yes. this really ugly, dirty shadow yeah. underworld. Yeah. Uh, I, I thought I'd escaped it, but I'm back in it. And I often feel like I need to go and bathe in the rivers of Jordan to clean myself of what, I've, what I know. And, and, and Jacques Poe has made it visible now. But I'd go and watch you and think, mm, let's see what, let's see what God's well, doing here. I'm going to get back to, and to the rest right. of the you've second. And you've been right, you've been right. Oh, good. Yeah. Because I was amazed, <laughs> I found myself in your book. I mean, yes, you did. I did. You did. In the, in that, in the chapter about my mom. Yeah, when you, you go to visit your white Sangoma astrologer friend. Yes. I, I bumped, I bumped into you, and I, d I happened to just mention the bees. The, yeah. And and because it was such a peculiar occurrence right. outside this terrible industrial funeral parlor with these ridiculous rituals going on, my poor mum in her chipboard coffin, and this massive swarm of bees mm. at the entrance, and it just felt significant to me. And they didn't, yeah. they weren't hostile. And you told me. Yeah, they come from the ancestors' bees. Yeah. You mentioned that in the book that it, it was your Saturn return, and I think you yes, did take on well. board stuff about the Saturn return. I did. 
And uh, and you finished that chapter saying you're going to be ready next time. Yeah, I do want to tell you they come every twenty nine. I know. Is it like so is there, it there's, out? there's another is one coming. Really? You're not fifty eight yet. I think I am. No, How I don't think I? you're fifty eight. Sixty one. I was born. What am I? Fifty seven. Fifty seven. I don't. No, fifty six. You're fifty six. Oh God, you're Jesus, so at least I can brace myself. So yeah, and the second one is much better than the first. Oh, better. Yeah, the I first one is God. like a squeeze. The second one is like a release. I almost didn't didn't make it through that one. I must tell you, I you know kind of. Yeah, they live up to their <laughs> reputation. They certainly turns. They're very good at persuading people that astrology is real because yes. it happens every no, time. No, it's just chaotic. Yeah. And you think whatever you try and do to fix yeah. it, just no. This is exactly. you're not in control right now. And I had to. I mean, I, 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 I claim to be a material rash. I, I think the universe is indifferent most of the time. Mm. But I also am so open to, to to other ways of thinking, which is why I love living in Africa and South Africa. Yeah, it makes so. perfect sense to yeah. me. You know, to live with with the notion of ancestral gardens. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I feel my father. So, you mentioned Jacques Poe's book, which yes, has just come yes, out in the yes, last yes, couple yeah. of weeks. Yeah. And that how you've gone back into that side of, side of journalism. Everyone knows that you've been a major part of writing about the, the Gupta leaks and uh, the whole process of the captured state. And um, so, firstly, considering Jacques Poe and what's just been going on there, have you ever felt unsafe? Have you ever felt in danger? Well, actually, at times I have. I have to ex- explain that the Gupta leaks is very much a daily maverick sort of thing. Yes, when it, you when it happened, we realized, oh, shit, this is really big. Now, I'm one of those journalists, I'm one of those people. I have a problem with money. I dislike it. I dislike the financial system, and I dislike what it means. Mm. So my big flaw as a journalist is the inability to understand money. Okay. And and so I was able to I'm able to do that kind of journalism on a, on a different level, which is uh, to explain to ordinary people like myself uh, who don't get the money, what what was happening, who who the key players are. Then you get these amazing people in Amagongani and Scorpio, who can follow the money trails, who understand how shelf companies work. Out. Mm-hmm. But this is global. This is a global new thing. Journalists in the future are going to have to track the people who steal our money, and Putin's done it. Uh, Trump has done it. Jacob Zuma is a, is a bit player in a very big global, yeah. complete shift in, in what politics is. There so this isn't hasn't always, always, always been going on. It's like the new politics. Well, I think it's the new politics. It's slowly been leading up to it. And it, what is wonderful about it is that South Africa is once again at the center of a global change. Mandela did that in a, in, in a way. And I think if you look at what's happening now, there was a very interesting piece, I think, in the Financial Times this week which indicates that the role of KPMG, McKinsey, all these, these firms, accountants and consultants, in milking the South African state, is actually the story. We know politicians are corrupt. Mm, exactly. They were that's, corrupt that's in the past. Pieces, yeah. Look, take your 10%, but yeah. for God's sake, build the hospital. Yeah. You know, we participate in the charade of democracy. We vote for you, because we know. Uh, but we expect the so-called private sector the accountants, the bean counters, to actually hold hold politicians in line, not tell them, look, this is a good offshore place. The New Paradise Papers shows you mm. that there is a terrible voraciousness around that. So it's, it's, it's capitalism, unfettered, unregulated, and it's, 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 it has wreaked havoc in the world. And it is creating... A, a wide gap. There isn't a yeah. middle. There, well, there is still a middle class, but it's slow. It's quickly disappearing. There's an absence of 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 of, of, of finding your way out of this hole. It's mm. deliberate. Mm. You get more. They, they've created fake money or non-existent money. So we all create more and more debt. No matter how hard you work, it just you know suddenly rates will go up. You, you'll have to pay more for water. So just when you think you're above water, you you owe again. So there's a part of me that's rebellious that thinks I will die owing millions, and I will. Divorce my family so that they can't legally be responsible for it. If that's what you want from me, banks, yeah. SARS, and everyone else, fine, I'll play the game. Yeah. You know, but I, I don't want to. I want to do the right thing. But I do think this is a global thing, and I think we're going to realize it more and more and more. And I think journalists have going to, are going to have to become forensic investigators. And so what Jacques has done is, is expose the people behind it. He's named them. We've known who they are. A lot of us have known. I found it very hard to... Uh, discover and, and uncover exactly the, the, the extent of it and he's just put it all in the book and done a lot of, of his own legwork as well got mm. people to speak to him 
So that's what I've been immersed, immersed in for the last two to three years, and it hasn't been pleasant. So then the question then begs, does it ever end? Will capitalism eventually collapse into itself? Or is there an end to I don't this? know. I, I, what I'm hoping is... South Africans practice direct, direct democracy in rural areas. Mm. It's been corrupted, mm. it's been poisoned mm. by the previous apartheid government. But there's something very beautiful about the constitution and traditional law. And if you go back and look at some of the work that's been done with the Bachatla, Bachafera tribes, and what's happened with the Wild Coast in terms of mining, you see tremendous potential in South Africa for a return to direct democracy. And so that's where you know people have access to the chief. Yes. He listens to everyone. Yes. They're sitting with like councils like and everyone discusses. Yes. But this, this strange, we all have it. White South Africans have lived for many years in a world that is of champagne parties mm -hmm. and no worries, swimming pools and Chevrolet. And that's what everybody else wants. But it's not what we should be wanting. We should, no. be, we, we should be wanting. That's what was surprised me the most about the South African transition is I thought we'd become more African. I think it was just, just the systems were so entrenched uh, that it wasn't possible to, um, to dislodge it. Mm. And, and I think it's human nature to want those things. Yeah. And I'm not, sure, I'm not sure globally what capitalism, I loathe it. Mm. And people think when I say that, that I'm a communist. I'm a social democrat. Yeah. I but would like us all to have enough. Yeah. I don't understand why you need 13 cars in the basement. I'm working on another story now where once again you realize that there are foreign white interests, business people, mm. who have corrupted South Africans, black and white. And I find there's something so contemptuous and loathsome of that attitude that you can come here yeah. and buy off people in government and yeah. then in, you know, in the process... It's extremely predatory. I mean, it's very predatory. In the extreme. And, and they are white people. Mm. And so white men are a monopoly capital. It's not Johan Rupert. I mean, Johan Rupert is a businessman. Yeah. All businessmen, you know, I mean, even Mother Teresa, there's, there's nothing you can do in a capitalist world that is without sin, <laughs> to, yeah. to use that word. Johan Rupert creates jobs and he sells luxury goods and he pays tax and he used to run tobacco. Right, exactly. But but he, he has not captured the state. Yeah, that's the difference. There are other white businessmen who have and it shall emerge in, in good time. Mm. But these are dangerous times. Very, I haven't felt personally threatened. I have now and again. The, the Guptas and the, the shadow state is one part of the, mm. of the story. The other part of the story involves commercial interests who have mm -hmm. captured the state. Right, and, and as you and, say, and it's, capitalism won't and it's lie down And it's a much quietly. more dangerous one because it's about how we maintain law and order mm. and what that means. So do you think, I mean, I really want to put it this way, do you think there's any hope for us yeah. in South Africa? Yeah, I do. What's our hope? Well, I suppose my, my hope is that, uh, and I always say this and it's become a bit of a corny cliche, but I always quote Marx, not Karl Groucho Marx. Right. Who you can believe, me or your eyes. Okay. South Africans defeated apartheid. Mm. One of the biggest beasts that ever Remember, roamed. We yeah. lived there. Yeah, and it was, not, it was this low-grade, ongoing civil mm. war. We're there again. We throw stones. We disrupt. We know. Mm. I think there's something about South Africans. Um, I don't think we're exceptional. But I, I think the exiles who came back in the ANC and who are now running the show don't understand the exile mentality. Yeah. And I, but I, what I do worry about is that there's a lack of political education. I mean, there's a fabulous series called Have You Heard From Johannesburg? Mm. I quoted it recently. Mm. Where you hear, which we didn't see in South Africa, Oliver Tambo speaking. Yeah. And, you, and you see the, the justness and rightness of that struggle. So the ANC consisted of Mandela, cauterized like a monk on Robben Island and becoming the spiritual being. And then Oliver Tambo, this amazingly principled human being uh, in the outside world, building the international uh, face of the ANC. And then you have what happened in Africa in the camps where Jacob yeah. Zuma was. Yeah. And others, and they're in, they're in they're ascendancy. Exactly. And I have met very, very strong, wonderful, principled people in this country who have kept me going the last two years. Whistleblowers inside mm. every department. They are. It's good they to are, know, as we know, whistleblowers suffer. They suffer. They get They've lost their pounded, jobs. Yeah. But there are so many good people. I have yeah. to believe. I mean, it was, I think, Vaclav Havel who talked about needing to hope mm. because that's what young people do. They, they intrinsically, developmentally, need to hope. And I sort of, while I'm heading for my second Saturn return, I have always maintained a hope that South Africans will be always five minutes to midnight. Mm. And even if we go past five minutes to midnight, that means we can't give up. Yeah. So I'm hoping the ANC will say to those in the middle, you have sinned, 
do not sin again. Because from here onwards, if the ANC manages to reconstitute itself, and it's going to be a hard, hard job, you need a leader who will go to those people and say, here, no more. You, are, you can stay in the party, we're not going to make you go out into the wilderness, but you serve the people from now on. Do they have such a person yet, or are we waiting for that to arise in the ranks from the youngsters? I don't know, I don't know. No. I'm an eternal pessimistic optimist. I think... I'm going to take that as a good thing. That sounds good. Well, it's been really great talking to you. We could talk so much more, but I do look forward to us sitting here in five years' time saying, isn't that amazing how that works out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And will. I believe that we're on, we on the same wavelength here. And you're also a, a, an umlungu who knows about the ancestors. Marianne's book was shortlisted for the Sunday Times Alan Patton Nonfiction Award earlier this year. So read it if you haven't. And read my book, which came out last week, and look for it online and in stores. And watch next week for the month ahead, including the auspicious month of December, ANC Elective Conference, and a look at what's happening in Zimbabwe. So be here next Friday.